Hi, my name is Sasha Möllering, and this is Open Source at Amazon. Uh, why Amazon cares about open source software. And this session will take approximately 35 minutes. And after these 35 minutes, you will have the chance to ask questions. So I would prefer if you just collect your questions regarding the topics I will discuss today. And then in the Q&A session, which will be approximately 10 minutes, we can um, dive deeper into the questions that you have. So for over 20 years, the use and adoption of open source by developers and business has been growing and organizations of all sizes and across all industries, from startups to the most regulated business now use and depend on open source software. And in this session, I will cover what is open source and how we think about it at Amazon Web Services. So open source is something that basically has emerged in the past 20 to 30 years, but to really understand the underpinning behaviors as well as what makes open source so compelling, we have to look to the past. If we look back to England and the industrial revolution of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, engineers would harness collective innovation for the greater good. And they would create plans, uh, build and then share these during academic tours around the country, inviting feedback and suggestions for improvements. And this allowed new ideas and innovations, lowered the barrier to entry for new engineers and led, the, led to the building of more efficient and better iron mills and pumps. If you move to more recent times, long before the term open source existed, the concept of open source uh, was basically very much alive. So the idea of open source was used by companies like DC and IBM who wanted to sell hardware but lacked the required software. So engineers and academics would have meetups and they would share expertise and applications they have written on magnetic tapes. And in 1974, the Copyright Act covered uh, computer source code, but not the resulting bytecode. That was the outcome of compiling the code. And that changed in 1983, however, and copyright now extended to cover bytecode. And this led to an increase in commercial activities and software moving uh, what had previously been thought of a hobbyist or more academic pursuit into a more commercial one. And this resulted in more software being available under commercial terms with um, no source code being made available. And this led to the creation in 1984 of the Free Software Foundation that wanted to address this lack of source code that viewed this practice as ethically wrong. And it wasn't until 1998, however, that the term open source was coined and uh, was came about from the analysis of how different types of free software were being developed. And for over 20 years, the open source initiatives or OZ has led to the increased awareness and adoption of open source across developers and businesses. And open source basically was a shift away from free software to a more commercial and business friendly way of applying the same principles. While um, Free software used the four freedoms as a litmus test. The OC set out that all open source licenses needed to adhere to the open source definition. So which is basically a set of 10 requirements that the license must be to qualify as open source. And today there are over 70 such licenses. So the first very important rule is basically the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Um, the freedom to study how the program works, to change it. Um, so it does your computing as you wish. So it is necessary to have access to the source code for this. And then um, the third freedom is the freedom to redistribute copies so it can help your neighbor. And the freedom to redistribute uh, copies of your modified versions. And by doing this, uh, you can give the whole community a, a, a chance to benefit from your changes. And access to the source code is also a precondition for this. So why did we need the OC and the OSD? So I'm not going uh, through these, but the OSD is a fundamental component of what makes uh, something open source. Open source as defined by the OC definition was designed uh, to be as business friendly version of free software basically. And when we look at what open source is today, it's two things. 
First, it is a mechanism that allows developers to easily license the software they create under terms that follow open source principles and allows someone consuming that software to understand how they can use it. And the second is the way that software is collaboratively developed by supporting tools and governance models, as well as emerging frameworks and methodologies to support that. From the business perspective, open source is basically a set of levers and tactics you can use for a number of different outcomes. Understanding what outcomes you're looking to achieve is critical to ensuring how to leverage open source effectively. And successful open source businesses are successful because they run a good business first and align open source mechanisms to outcomes such, uh, such as um, solving software engineering challenges, entering or disrupting markets and developing and attracting developers more. So once you know what you are looking to achieve with your open source project, you can now select the appropriate license to help achieve that outcome. And the first freedom, however, is whether you want to license something under open source. So you do not need to open source everything. You should be sufficiently intentional in your approach. So there are so many resources available that provide simplified guidance on how to choose a license based on what you're looking to achieve. And you should seek qualified legal guidance if in doubt. And open source sits in the middle of the copyright and rights spectrum with public domain, all rights relinquished to the left-hand side and commercial or restrictive licenses where you have much tighter control on the right. If we look at where open source sits in the spectrum, we can see that there are two generalized types of open source licenses. The first are what we call permissive licenses such as Apache 2, MIT, or BSD. And the second set are the less permissive licenses, such as GNU public license, lesser GNU public license, or Mozilla license. And there, these are often referred to as copyleft. And this group is itself split into two different groups with stronger and weaker variants of these copyleft licenses. And the principal difference between the permissive and the copyleft licenses are the obligations that you are required to follow. For example, making all source code available or ensuring all modifications are shared upstream. Permissive, uh, permissive licenses have fewer obligations. So one of the big questions is why do developers love open source software? Well, when I speak with them, um, there are some common themes that usually emerge. Working on open source software um, provides developers the ability to learn new skills, often working with other developers with more experience who they can learn from. And this often leads to new opportunities uh, for those developers as well as increasing their network and personal brand. So developers love and are more successful when working with open source, but um, one remaining question is what about the business? Well, Obviously, open source is also good for business, whether it is accelerating innovation by focusing in building just what differentiates you, how business can use open source to enter and disrupt markets, the economics of open source or that business can now be stakeholders and drive decisions in the software that is strategically important to them. And there are many reasons why open source is good for business and why businesses love open source. When we look at the typical adoption of open source software and enterprises, this is basically the patterns that you usually can see. So in the early days, many businesses refused to use or even consider using open source software, which is stage zero here in this graph. And this slowly changed as open source projects grew, matured, and began to underpin many commercial products. So businesses began to experiment with open source software and this experimentation together with external forces led to acceptance and use. When open source, um, open source uh, software soon proved its value and so many businesses shifted to standardized and champion open source software and looked to use managed versions of those open source projects to address support and maintenance requirements. Many organizations, however, stopped at the stage. So, um, those who are basically happy to, to consume open source, but not to collaborate with open source projects themselves. And as a result, many businesses are failing to take advantage of the opportunities that this collaboration will bring. And what we find is that this loss of opportunity is a result 
of failing to incorporate open source levers within their business strategy. And um, this is a very interesting survey by Black Duck in 2017. And those showed that the key benefits organizations drew from uh, going beyond consumption were competitive advantage, reducing development costs and improving quality and uh, also reliability. When we look at some of the research that has been done to understand in more detail, we can see that um, these in terms of, um, in terms of increased productivity, um, doubling the productivity when comparing it just to consuming open source and also higher quality as seen in this research paper showing that developers spent more time reviewing work done when contributing to open source projects. And it is not just productivity and higher quality. When we look at the economics of developing software, we can see that when you embrace developing products with open source, you can spread a significant amount of the efforts to a broader group of contributors. When we look at the typical costs associated with developing a code base, if you're doing all this yourself, then you take on all the costs, which you can see um, in this graph on the left, which is basically the blue part. And when you start working out in the open, you can see the amount of effort and contributions is shared and the proportion of work you need to do, which is still in blue, but uh, a lot less, is reduced over the lifetime of the code base. So it is clear that basically builders and their businesses love and embrace open source. And Amazon cares about open source for the same reasons that our customers and also builders do. So let's take a closer look. As a company, uh, we are customer obsessed. This is, this is our first leadership principle. And we don't lead what the coolest tech is or what competitors are doing or what delivers the best short-term results. So we aim to build a relationship with customers that um, outlasts any of us. Many of our customers are really enthusiastic users and creators of open source software, and using it to speed up their own pace of innovation, uh, improve productivity and more. And other th uh, others are just starting to use open source, often at the same time that they are first venturing onto the cloud of part of their IT modernization journeys. Cloud and open source has always been highly interdependent and cloud was built on open source and built to run open source. So cloud has also propelled the growth of open source, making it easy for customers uh, to deploy and use open source software. Cloud has provided validation that open source is robust and production ready and increased awareness and provided validation for many open source projects and technologies. And our participation in and the support of open source uh, encompasses our own projects, uh, code contributions to other projects and financial support of open source foundations and projects as well as the force multiplier effects of customers being able to run open source in the cloud either on their own or via managed services. So we focus on staying as close to upstream as possible. And as open source contributors and, and, and as open source contributions bubble up from within our teams, as it helps them to reduce technical debt and reduces maintenance burden. So in open source, many eyes means all bugs are shallow. And in many cases, this can also improve quality and security. When we created uh, S2N, our Apache um, 2.0 license TLS implementation, it was super beneficial to get more feedback and developers reviewing the code. So, and as customers migrate to the cloud, many look for opportunities to modernize. So we provide options for customers who want to do this. Many customers, for instance, are moving from .NET to .NET Core, which is the open source implementation of .NET. And many then look at modernizing, at modernizing further by um, deploying it using a serverless approach or a managed container service. Now our customers are looking to use open source as an approach to migrate from proprietary licensing regimes to open source equivalents. And this also uh, allows them to free the organization from disruptions caused by unexpected and sometimes punitive license policy changes. We provide assistance that can help you if you're looking to move more workloads to Linux, including migrating Microsoft SQL Server from Windows to Linux. 
We also have the database migration service that allows you to migrate your proprietary databases to a number of open source alternatives, such as MySQL or Postgres. And we have hundreds of thousands of customers that have used this service since it was launched. And many enterprises um, or many enterprise applications are built on Java. Java is still very super popular in enterprise environments. So Amazon Coretto is a certified open source distribution of OpenJDK that can be used as a drop-in replacement for many Java SE distributions, uh, providing you with the security patches and bug fixes you need and provide you a single Java distribution to manage across all your environments. And uh, Amazon Coretto also provides innovations such as the Amazon Coretto cryptographic provider that can significantly improve cryptographic operations in your application. Uh, we have a very interesting blog post about this um, particular implementation showing where you can really reduce um, the number of CPU cycles um, spent on cryptographic operations in your application. And open source enables hybrid capabilities, allowing customers to make choices based on the level of flexibility and customization they want, and the skills and resources they have, or the level of risk they want to take on. So using services such as DMS, which is the database migration service, uh, customers can move off proprietary database platform and move onto open source databases such as, let's say, um, Amazon RDS, MySQL, or Postgres. And customers can then choose whether and how they want to run those workloads moving forward. So they can keep running on existing self-managed versions of open source technologies, but many customers, however, do not want to have to manage those open source products and want someone else to manage, patch, secure, scale, and operate them. So they look to use AWS managed services equivalents. So customers want to get the benefits of open source, but maybe do not have the skills and resources to deploy, configure, patch, and operate these open source projects. So AWS has been building and operating open source for many years. And our customer um, obsession to, to making our customers' lives easier led us to operationalizing open source to make it easy to use. And here's a look at some of our AWS services for open source across different categories, such as data analytics, databases, compute, machine learning, and many more. And these managed services allow customers to quickly get started using these open source technologies and not to have to worry um, about having to actually run them. And they integrate with other AWS services, making it easy for customers to incorporate these open source services in their solutions. And the sustainability and viability of open source is very important to our customers, which is why we are a significant contributor and supporter of the open source community. Since um, AWS launched in 2006, we have contributed to a broad variety of open source software projects and will continue to do as we seek to help our customers. So let's take a closer look at what those contributions look like. So first and foremost, in GitHub, you find over 2,400 projects spread across a number of organizations from all across Amazon, through, uh, though uh, about 80% come from AWS. So you can use the search box on um, aws.github.io to find projects of interest uh, to you across all GitHub organizations. And just for starters, all of our SDKs are fully open source. Um, all our documentation is open source and also the AWS CLI is open source. So you can take a closer look what is happening if you do, for instance, uh, a call uh, using the AWS Java SDK. So, um, and we'll talk about some of the most significant projects in a bit. And this is a sample of our open source projects. Some of these projects may not be familiar to you, but are super interesting. So let's take a look at some of them. Uh, Particle, is an open source project that allows you to provide a single query language across all your data sources. If so easy to effectively query data, regardless of where or in what format it is stored. Then we have Amazon SageMaker Neo, uh, which enables developers to train machine learning models once and run them anywhere in the cloud and at the edge on devices with limited resources. And we have the AWS um, serverless application model, which is an open source framework for building serverless applications. 
And then I've already mentioned S2N, which is short for signal to noise, uh, which is a new open source transport layer security implementation. And Amplify is a development platform for building secure, scalable, modern mobile uh, and web applications that makes it really easy to add additional capabilities such as authentication, machine learning, and more. And the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is a vendor neutral home for projects and enable building cloud native applications. So we have things like Kubernetes, ContainerD, and Envoy. Um, these are some of the CNCF's well-known projects. And Amazon is a founding member of ContainerD. Amazon EKS, which is our managed Kubernetes service, uh, is a CNCF conformant release, which means that any Kubernetes application that runs on a particular conformant version would run on EKS as well. So we also participate actively in the Kubernetes Special Interest Group, AWS, where all the AWS related issues are discussed. And a very interesting um, thing that always comes with container related workloads is networking. So networking in Amazon ECS and EKS um, use container networking plugins or CNIs, which are standard interfaces for enabling networking in containers. And most of these plugins are open source, so you can use it also, for instance, uh, with COP. So if you want to have a self-managed um, Kubernetes cluster, you can take the CNI implementation, then use the VPC native implementation of networking in AWS. Um, Envoy is a CNCF graded project, project um, and it's an open source proxy that enables monitoring and control of microservices. And at reInvent 2018, we announced AWS AppMesh, which provides a managed control plane for Envoy. Again, all changes made to Envoy will be upstreamed. In 2016, we released an open source specification under Apache 2.0 called Serverless Application Model, uh, which used to be a simple configuration file to define Lambda functions and other serverless resources. And since then, we have open sourced the underlying implementation of SAM and several other tools to simplify the process of building serverless applications, including SAM CLI, which is a popular CLI to run SAM based applications on a local computer before deploying to the cloud. And between two GitHub repositories, we have over 200 con um, contributors who had fixed bugs, contributed important features, written documentation, and most importantly, maintain a healthy community. And what has started as an open specification matured into a complete ecosystem of open source projects, uh, comprising of serverless examples, reference architectures, libraries, CLIs, and plugins. And we want to enable you to use the tools you're already comfortable with. So um, many, of you, um, many of you told us that you want live debugging of Lambda code. So at Reman 2018, we announced the general availability of the AWS toolkit for PyCharm. And we are also active developing AWS toolkits, for instance, for Visual Studio Code or IntelliJ. And this will enable you to easily develop serverless applications, including a full create, step through debug and deploy experience in the IDE and language of your choice, be it in uh, Python, Java, Node, or .NET. And for Java, this is also available for Amazon ECS. So this supports uh, cloud debugging, which is currently in beta. And this enables you to debug your cloud applications by directly accessing code running in the cloud. So cloud debugging currently supports debugging containerized applications running on Amazon ECS with AWS Fargate, and you can view logs, set breakpoints, and get a terminal into the running container, which is super useful if you want to debug your Java application. Um, OpenJDK is the project where all the open source development of the Java language and runtime happens. And there are a few binary distributions of OpenJDK, such as the one from Oracle. And Amazon is basically a big Java shop. And many of the AWS services uh, our customers use are running the Java virtual machine. And we started building OpenJDK internally because we wanted a better cadence of releases and bug fixes for our own services. So 
But after talking to, to customers, we realized they wanted that as well. So we created our own distribution of OpenJDK and named it Amazon Coretto. And um, in Italy, Coretto is an espresso shot with alcohol. Typically, it's, it's grappa. There is no cost associated with Coretto, and we offer Coretto 8 builds corresponding to OpenJDK 8 and Coretto 11 builds corresponding to OpenJDK 11. So we also offer long-term support for Coretto 8 at least until 2023 and Coretto 11 at least 2024. And we slowly started migrating our services from Oracle JDK to OpenJDK. And over thousands of services that are using Coretto in production, we only found uh, a few class path issues. So it is drop-in replacement for your existing Oracle JDK. And Coretto is available on Linux, Windows, macOS, and Docker, and also Red Hat Enterprise, Linux, Ubuntu. And what is super important for Docker-related workloads, there is also an Alpine uh, Linux-based distribution of it. So it's uh, compiled with MuzzleLibc. And there, this is no internal fork of OpenJDK. So everything in Coretto is either included in upstream or filed as an issue and attached as a patch. And up to now, when working with containers, you have to choose between containers with fast setup times and high density, or VMs with strong hardware virtualization based security and workload isolation. And with a Firecracker project, you can basically have it all. So Firecracker is a virtualization technology purpose built for creating and managing secure multi-tenant micro VMs for serverless computing, uh, whether that's containers or functions, and we open source it. And with Firecracker, you can deploy workloads in lightweight virtual machines called micro VMs, which provide enhanced security and workload isolation over traditional VMs while enabling the speed and resource efficiency of containers. Um, and Firecracker was initially developed uh, at AWS to improve the experience of services like AWS Lambda or um, AWS Fargate. And some of our customers are using rapidly growing open source, um, are using a rapidly growing open source project called Spinnaker, which was originated at Netflix and is used to deploy um, all of their applications and microservices. And at AWS, we work with our customers, no matter what platform they're using to deploy their applications. And we began contributing to Spinnaker in 2018 and have integrated support for EKS and Fargate and contributed a Lambda cloud driver. So we also wrote tooling to deploy Spinnaker on top of EKS that's available at that first thing. And additional efforts will be focused on uh, API throttling, uh, by, by, by integrating AWS config. Bottle Rocket, uh, which is super interesting, is a Linux-based open source operating system that is purpose-built by us for running containers on virtual machines or bare metal hosts. Um, most customers today run containerized application on general purpose operating systems that are updated package by package, which makes OS updates um, difficult to automate. And updates to Bottle Rocket are applied in a single step rather than package by package. And this single step update process helps reduce management and overheads by making OS updates easy to automate using um, container orchestration service. And the single step updates also improves uptime for container applications by minimizing update failures and enabling um, easy update rollbacks. So this means um, when you do an update for um, auto rocket based um, EC2 instance, uh, then it is an atomic operation that you can roll back. Additionally, uh, Bottle Rocket includes only the essential software to run containers, which improves resource usual usage and reduces the, the attack surface. And I've previously mentioned that when we launch a service based on open source, we make it basically a long-term commitment to support our customers. And this means contributing back to those upstream projects. So we contribute bug fixes, security, scalability, performance, and feature enhancement back to the community. We've made significant contributions to a myriad of open source projects, including Zen, Linux, 
KVM, Java, Quintus, Chromium, also robot operating system, and many more. And these are just a subset of projects, um, and we continue growing our contributions. We have a simple streamlined process to make uh, contribution to make contributions, which has uh, made it easy for our engineers to, to participate in those open source projects. And this was a list of some of the projects that our customers have asked us to contribute to. And so one of the questions for us is, are there any other open source projects that we should contribute to? So 90 to 95% of our roadmap is driven by customers. So uh, please ping us and, and tell us where we should um, also contribute. So ensuring the health and success of open source communities is super critical. So let me show how we participate in those communities. So with open source, uh, open source work happens in the projects and many belong to a foundation. So you can open issues, contribute code and participate in the technology of a project without joining the relevant foundation. So we join foundations because being part of them allows us to participate in the strategic direction of projects to help ensure that those projects continue to develop in alignment with what our customers expect from us. We're members of the Linux Foundation, where we were also founding members of two initiatives, the Core Infrastructure Initiative and uh, the Open Container Initiative. And with Amazon EKS service nearing launch and the growing interest from our customers and other CNCF projects, we realized that this was important enough for us to join at the Platinum level. We're also sponsors of the Apache Software Foundation, the um, Open Source Initiative, and many more that you can see on, on the screen. And providing credits to support open source projects is an important way to show our support. And the AWS promotional credit for open source project was launched last year as a mechanism to help more projects. More open source projects um, have already uh, applied and are benefiting from these credits. And during the past few years, uh, we had talks accepted through the standard uh, call for paper process at a variety of open source conferences, which gave us basically the chance to share what we are building, um, how we are building it, the lessons learned, what worked and uh, what, what doesn't work. And one of the important force multipliers, which I've mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, is the ability to raise awareness of open source, open source projects, both our own and those of our customers or the community. And here we have a landing page that talks about all of the open source efforts or conference talks, social media, latest blogs, uh, open jobs, and much more. Our Twitter handle AWS Open uh, was launched at OSCON in 2017. We use that to share news about everything open source related to AWS and Amazon. And we have published uh, over 220 posts since the blog was launched and about 20% of the posts have been published by guest authors from the open source community. So we're always looking for uh, more customers or open source community contributions. So if you have a topic for a possible post, please get in touch with uh, at AWS open on, on Twitter and let us know uh, what, what's, what, what you could share with us. <clears throat> there was one question, AWS, does it contribute to health uh, system as well? Um, Yes, so um, one of the things that uh, spontaneously uh, came into the back of my head is that we uh, share large data sets, which, which can be used, which um, a lot of customers and um, public institutions use, for instance, for, for, for cancer research. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>